chocolate story. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot uh, into 105 years of history of Purdy's chocolates here today. We have to, everybody's been asking me, are we going to have chocolates? I mean, who wants chocolates? <laughs> what we like to do, we eat a lot of chocolate, we test chocolate. We're going to start with the chocolate tasting. Everybody okay with that? We need, we need to, uh, you know, we've had her, you're having some coffee now, and we had a little dessert, now you're going to have uh, some chocolate teasing. So we've got some chocolates going around, and I need a chocolate here. Where's where? I need a chocolate. We've got to pass me a chocolate. If we're, if don't eat it yet, because we're going to take you through uh, a proper tasting of uh, chocolate. Thank you, dude. I'm going to describe this. I want everybody to grab a chocolate. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Don't start eating it yet. This is a test. So the whole theme of the, uh, of the Food Pro West, um, and it's fantastic to see some, such a wonderful turnout here tonight, uh, is staying competitive in times of change. And certainly, um, I can uh, talk to that about uh, with Purdy's chocolates over the last 105 years. Um, really, Purdy's is a BC food processing success story. We started in 1907 on Robson Street, and today continue to be successful with our factory kitchen in Vancouver. So, I see some people eating already here. Nico's not following along here. Okay. So when you taste chocolate, you need to use all your senses. Okay, so the first thing I want everyone to look, what we should look at is the, is the, is the proper shine, uh, shine and texture of the chocolate. It should have a nice gloss. That's indication, this is my, I won't bore you with too many technical details, but that has to be the proper temper of the chocolate. So the proper formation of the cocoa butter crystals will give that nice shine and texture. So it's a very technical product. So you want to have that nice shine, pleasing look. I see some more people eating already. <laughs> <laughs> Not listening to instructions. No, um, I know it's hard to resist birdies, right? So uh, the next thing you want to look at is just, it's just the the, uh, the the aroma. So take it, take a nice smell. The strong essence of dark chocolate. Anybody show off what else you uh, taste there? Or smell there. Never wait that long. Stan wants two chocolates here. So the next thing is, now, now you want to look at, so you've been holding this chocolate, some of you have been eating. A good high quality chocolate should be slightly melting in your hands now. So you've got, you can lick the, that off if you'd like, but it should be slightly melting in your hands that it's, uh, that it's uh, the crystal structures are melting at, your, at, the room, at the skin temperature of your hand. Now you get to eat it, okay? So take a bite of that. Many of you know that uh, when you eat, when you taste anything, but 80% of your description of the taste is done through your olfactory system. It's only about 20% that actually gets defined by the taste buds in your in your mouth. So now you're going to start describing that. Who can? Who's? What, is, what do you taste? Stan, what do you taste? Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> He's very descriptive. I know Nico says phenomenal. Anybody else? Any more <laughs> specifics? Cocoa. I couldn't hear you. Cocoa. Cocoa. Yeah, loves cocoa hints there. And you notice this this chocolate is a Torona. This is uh, this is a new chocolate that we started about a year ago. The bottom layer is a Jindouya. Uh, first layer is a, is a Jindouya almond and hazelnut Jindouya. You notice that uh, that texture in there? That's actually a French pastry flake entwined in that first layer. So it adds a very nice texture. The top layer, um, the second layer, is a uh, is a rich dark chocolate truffle made with fresh whipping cream. And I have to give a shout out to my friend Raheem. Where's Raheem? Raheem, there you go. Meadow Fresh Dairies, where we had our uh, our fresh whipping cream. So you notice that the, the combination of those layers um, really hit off that piece, and the uh, couverture on this piece is made with a 65 percent. Peruvian chocolate. So this is a chocolate um, from Peru. Um, it's interesting on its own. You'll notice an essence of banana in the uh, in, in this uh, Peruvian chocolate. And that's because the cocoa plantation was was uh, originally uh, a banana plantation. So it has the slightest essence of banana in that Peruvian 65% dark chocolate. So everybody love that. Okay, there you go. Now we we have to start with the chocolate tasting. So now I'm going to go through. The story of Curtis. I think there is some 
<laughs> we all have some fantastic, uh, fantastic food that we get to eat. It's a, it's a real perk of what we do in the, in the food industry that we get to uh, taste at all times. So I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot of uh, it's all about the taste, and I need to put a smile on our customers' face. I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot of 105 years of history tonight about Purdy's. Um, all of our businesses in this room, some are at the startup, some are very established. Um, hopefully there's some learnings we can take from each other, and I'm going to share some of the learnings that we've had over 105 years of history. So everybody can see the uh, overheads, uh, the, uh, the uh, screen, I hope. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Purdy, an entrepreneur. Started in 1907. Uh, Richard Carmen Purdy opens up his uh, chocolate shop on Robinson Street in Vancouver. Very quickly, within uh, seven years of opening up, World War I breaks out. So we all think we have challenges in our business day to day. Well, we didn't have a World War breakout in, uh, in the last uh, time. So imagine Richard Purdy seven years into his business. Okay, this is a this is a roadblock. This is a, a, a roadblock and, uh, and a, a stumbling point. And how is he going to uh, deal with this? So he continues on making chocolates, and he was very successful. He was very um, fastidious about quality and ensuring that every chocolate was uh, perfect for his customer. Um, 1920s, he expanded. Uh, so uh, it took him about uh, 13, 15 years or so, and he expanded to Granville Street, and he had a factory in the basement of his store. So successful startup uh, operation at this point. I have to show you this. I'm going to show you a few old ads that we have too. We're fortunate with this history that we have to have some uh, wonderful archives. So this is from 1918, this ad. So pretty incredible if you think about how many years this is. So I'll read this off to you. Purdy's chocolates are as good as usual. <laughs> One feature of Purdy's chocolates is that they have always the same good flavor and fineness. Mr. Purdy is very particular about that. He uses the best grade of chocolate obtainable. Price is not a consideration. When he buys nut meats, they must come direct to the store from the cracking house. So they will not taste rancid. It's always a good idea that your food does not taste rancid. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting thing to put into an ad. <laughs> For cream, he buys the richest he can get in the city, and we do the same today. There you have a simple explanation of Purdy's goodness. Maker of Purdy's chocolates, 675 Granville Street. So that's 1918. That was uh, that was that was out. So incredible, interesting history. So I'll take you to the next step. So we all have road, uh, uh, road bumps, uh, you know, speed bumps on the, on the way to uh, building our businesses. Um, 1925 was his first major challenge. Um, he had financial problems. Uh, rumor has it that Mr. Uh, Purdy was um, incredibly fastidious about the quality of his chocolates, but he uh, he, he also liked fast horse, slow horses or fast horses and. So we like to, uh, he was at the racetrack a little bit, and I guess he was a better chocolate maker than a business man. And so his business actually uh, sadly went into receivership in, uh, in 1925. Enter uh, this man, this photo on the, on the right, which is, his name is Hugh Forrester. He was actually, uh, Mr. Forrester was uh, Purdy's accountant. So, uh, <laughs> I'll leave that for you. For <laughs> So, uh, very smart man, Mr. Forrester. Hugh Forrester bought Purdy's from receivership. Um, and, and in the 1930s, so another uh, speed bump along the way, a bit of depression. And so this uh, business that has two shops, he quickly goes in, he has some crazy ideas. I'm going to open late, which is, you know, nobody did, right? I'm going to open late and I'm going to have weekend specials. That's how I'm going to uh, drive and create uh, further success um, and stay competitive um, in, in the marketplace. So, depression came. Well, I got to show you this. This is another. Uh, this is another um, uh, letter, actually, that Hugh Forrester sent out to clients in 1931. It says, "Dear oh. sirs, wouldn't it be a nice Christmas? Wouldn't it be a nice Christmas compliment to give that young lady in your office?" a box of Purdy's chocolates. It would be appreciated for Purdy's purple box is recognized as a gift of the highest quality. You may give a dollar box, many do. There are larger boxes, some with mirrors, up to $25. And that's that's 1931, $25 box. Um, 
Everything can be arranged over the telephone. See more 1960. So, um, interesting how, how uh, Mr. Hugh Forrester during the Depression really went after it and uh, um, his customers in this way and started the first uh, phone order, mail order system uh, at Purdy's. So, 1947, um, World War II, right? Um, sugar rations. Um, so, Hugh Forrester, uh, who's in the uh, far picture there, at that time, he had to open by open at noon, and he would be sold out of his chocolates by 12:30. 30 minutes is how he uh, stayed in business per day because of those uh, those sugar rations. So, how many of us could run a business uh, in 30 minutes a day? Different times, right? And uh, had to be um, smart about how he could keep going and stay competitive in changing times. So, um, I just want to stop there. It's interesting to think about at this point in time. So, the business is what almost 40 years old. He's, uh, it's been through uh, World War I, receivership, the Great Depression, World War II, and they're still trying to find a way to keep going. How many of us have had that many challenges? It's, it's, uh, it's stunning when you think about the, the different uh, time that they, they lived in. It survived and, and tried to stay competitive. And that's what we're all trying to do day in and day out in our businesses. So his son Frank joined the business in uh, the 1940s. And you can see Frank, he's, he's, uh, he's ready to go, right? Let's look at his hair, <laughs> right? Frank, you know, there's, there's you, the accountant, you know, been through the depression, been through the wars. Frank's like, put me in, coach. I'm ready to expand this business, and I'm gonna make it, uh, I'm gonna make it home. So Frank uh, says to his father, we've gotta open a bigger factory. And they did, they opened a factory on West 7th. Um, uh, the other things that, uh, that Frank did, uh, of interest, Frank said, you know what? We have two stores downtown. We've got to go to West Vancouver. We've got to open up a, a mall and we've got to open up a store at Park Royal in, in West Vancouver. So mind-boggling for Hugh. Uh, you know, the background of the story is he was like, wow, I'm sure this is uh, pretty risky. I'm not sure if I want to get into this, right? Um, and that was really the start of a family, um, the family problems that, that uh, broke up the business in the early 60s. Um, Frank, ready to go. Uh, Hugh, conservative father accountant, said, no, that's not the way I want to take this business. And they end up, it was uh, sadly enough, uh, they decided to, for them, they decided to sell the business. So another speed bump along the way. How does, uh, how does Purdy's move forward next? Um, family transition problems um, really were uh, the reason that they decided to sell Purdy's in 1963. So, 1963, um, Mr. Charles Sovell, who's, who's pictured here, um, he, uh, he and a partner at that time um, decided to look at this business and uh, saw, you know, they had four small uh, stores and, um, you know, uh, all in the Vancouver, one in, in, in West Vancouver at that time. So, you know what, I'm going to give this a go and I'm going to start this. He, Mr. Favell was really the manufacturing um, Brains mind the operation. His partner at the time, Eric Wilson, um, was more of the financial lead for the business. So Charles Savell bought the uh, bought Purdy's four stores and uh, in a small factory at West Seventh. Um, Mr. Favell's success, and he really started learning the, the business in the '60s, and um, was involved in a variety of associations, and really uh, speaks very highly of the learnings that he received uh, in the 60s from the various associations he was involved in and really um, saw a trend in shopping malls. And that was really the, the really a key point in Purdy's development that Mr. Vavell made very close ties and relationships with landlords and developers to get prime locations in these new called new fandangle things called shopping malls. And so um, that was how how we started to Purdy started to expand um, in the in the seventies, and it was rapid growth during that time. The shopping malls were going up everywhere. Also opened up in the late seventies into Alberta. I want to give you a, this is a picture of, of a Purdy shop in nineteen sixty nine. Love all the funky colors in the back, and uh, this is in Hillside Mall in Victoria. Um, to hear Mr. Favell tell this story, it was 
um, boy, we were moving, you know, as, as Hugh and Frank were moving to West Vancouver, Mr. Vell was moving all the way to Victoria. How am I going to get chocolates over to Victoria? How am I going to uh, make sure the shelf life and the quality is, is exceptionally and stays uh, high? Um, it was a hit from day one. Um, and uh, it continues today to be one of our very most successful shops. So advertising, I want to show you this. This is kind of a fun, fun one. So Mr. Mavell stayed, uh, stayed, uh, stayed with the time. So this is how to tame a kid with Nico. You can say it very well. Priorities, right? So um, that would be, uh, you can see this is the late 60s, right? Um, I've got to read to you a couple of things. It's kind of small, but you get the you get the gist of the ad there. Um, yeah. So one of the things it says in the bottom that I always think is kind of uh, interesting. For years, we have been selling candy to starry-eyed suitors, and it, and it gives some suggestions throughout. It says, "For being late for a date, bring chocolate creams. Enter her house, telling you have a sweet spot for her." Or soft, sorry, soft spot. What's <laughs> <laughs> oh, there? I'm supposed to be on my best behavior. <laughs> so how to tame a kid. So that, that's not an ad we're doing today, but actually we, we have this on our Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, site and really gets a lot of attention and comments. So, and the party story goes on. So how do you stay competitive in changing times? So certainly we've been through a lot of changing times through the 70s, 1980s. Needed a bigger factory. So we moved to Kingsway in East Vancouver. Mr. Favell, um, how he decided where to move is he took a map and he charted, he, he put a pin in the map where all his employees at that time lived. And he found most of them lived around East Vancouver. And so we went to look for a factory in that area. That's, that's how he determined where to build. And it was actually an old Canada Drive factory where we're still in today on, on Kingsway. So not everything worked well. The Seattle expansion. Um, Purdy's, uh, Purdy's was in Seattle from about uh, 19, early 1980s um, to fill up the brand new factory um, to about 1992. Didn't work well. Certainly, there's you know as as we all know, the things that don't work well, we can we can learn a lot from. And really, that was a really uh, it, I'll talk about it further on later. That's a really key learning part. Even though it didn't work and we had six shops, ended up closing them down in the early 90s, really key learning experience and, and we can adapt to uh, future opportunities. So 1994, uh, Mr. Favell, and you can see um, uh, Karen, uh, Mr. Favell's uh, daughter, pictured in the forefront there. Um, so family transition comes up. And what is Mr. You know, the, the talk around the business is what's Mr. Favell going to do? How are we going to stay alive and, and, and interest? And how's Purdy going to Purdy's going to keep going? Enter Karen and Mr. Favell. Lessons learned from past uh, experiences um, and seeing Hugh Forrester and Frank Forrester took a lot of time, energy, uh, and focus on a proper family transition. Mr. Favell was very involved and still is today very involved with the Canadian Association of Family Enterprises, or CAFE, um, and, and, he, and he's been very involved, and that organization was very key in, uh, in helping this transition um, between uh, Karen and uh, Mr. Bell. So Karen joined the business in 1994, um, became president in 1997, and we had a very successful family transition, which kept Purdy's strong and alive uh, and moving forward, able to move forward very successfully. So, um, other things. So, what comes next? 1999. So, we're, we're not in the 1931 letters that are going out to buy chocolate. So, we start up our, our website and we start doing uh, e commerce um, very successfully. We were very early on in the days of e commerce, and uh, that was a major initiative in, in uh, late 90s, just before Y2K. Everybody remember what, what a big issue that was? <laughs> So, you know, these things come and go over time, right? And, and our perspective on problems change and, and learning from the, what, we, what our experiences have been. So, in 2002, we started a fundraising business, which is very successful. So, 2004 comes along, and we've got our website, we've got a fundraising business. You know, we've, got, we've been successful in BC and Alberta. 
where are we going to grow next? And uh, I'll tell you an interesting uh, story. And you can all relate to these types of stories as you're growing your business. Um, so we said, we're never going to be in Ontario. Um, no, who wants to be on a five hour flight all the time? And I remember having conversations with Karen and saying, no, never, she's, no, we're never going to go to Ontario. There's not a chance. And at that point, I was, uh, I was uh, leading the uh, internet business. And so we were trying to grow the internet business. And I was saying, where can we really grow this? Well, we're never going to be in Ontario, right? So um, I'm going to take the internet business and try to promote it in Ontario. We were doing quite a bit of business in Toronto. So I phoned up uh, a leasing contact that I had and said, you know what, I want to I want to bring I want to really promote our internet. Do you have somewhere I can promote the internet in Ontario? And they said, well, you know, it was it was late on it was late September and it, it was getting late in the season. They didn't have a lot of space. They said, come to Upper Canada Mall, which is an hour north of Toronto. Some of you may know that. And we can set up a table there and you can promote the internet. So that was great. So I thought, okay, this is great. I'm just gonna try to roll up our sleeves. I got a couple people from the office, we had some family and friends in Ontario. We brought some hedgehogs with us and and we, we set up this table. We did chocolate taste test, and we had, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this. So the Friday morning, I'll never forget this, um, we set up the table and we we're ready to go. The mall doors open, and I think it was the first or second lady, and uh, told my wife this story. Um, she came running through the doors, her arms around me, and I'm like, whoa, she said, I don't know, arms around me gives me a big kiss. And I'm thinking, thank God Purdy's is here. And I was like, oh, this is, that's strange. The next person comes up, somebody came up and kissed the table. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, wow, what, like, what's going on here? And other people were hugging us, and they were so happy to see us. We had 5,000 people come in three days to our table. We couldn't. We sold out of chocolates, and um, we just couldn't couldn't imagine the the uh, uh, response. And uh, it, 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 it gives me goosebumps thinking about today because it's interesting. You can all relate to how you start your businesses, and. Uh, I remember saying to the two people, Grace and uh, Delma, that were with me at the time, we said, I said, when Ontario hits, this will be the moment. It was just palpable. You could tell there was something special happening in the response. And so I came back the Monday, I was back in the office, I said to Karen and the team, I said, I think we got, you know, we said never say never, we, we, we never said, we said we're never going to be in Ontario. I think we got a, and I told her the story and the response. And that was really the point we said, yes, we're going to put a kiosk in Ontario. And we did that the next year. And next month, we're opening our 12th permanent store in Ontario. And it's really just come on gangbusters. It's really been a, a success. So we all need to have areas we're going to grow in, right? And, and so that was our opportunity. Our, and, and so it really helped give a focus to everybody in the business that Ontario is our goal. We're going to conquer Ontario. So um, that's how that started. So, so that's a bit of the history, and I thought I'd tell you where we're at today. But before I get to that, it's not, you know, I talked a little bit about learning from our experiences. The more things change, the more we just see repeats of that. And I'll tell you an interesting story. Mr. Favell, I, I started with Purdy's uh, Chocolates uh, in 1998, and it was maybe the first couple of months I had been at Purdy's. And uh, I was in the factory and talking to some of the people on the line, and they were telling me, Peter, quality is just not good. Look at the shine on these chocolates. Look at the temper. It's not as good as it used to be. And I am just, you know, I'm young. And I'm like, oh my God, this is awful. And, I, and I'm running around trying to fix it and asking everybody, and you know, what is going on with the, what's changed or what's happened? And trying to ask the five whys and really get to the answer. And after you know, a few days, I saw Mr. Favell, uh, who was still involved. And in, as I told you, his love, first love is the factory. Went to him, I said, you know what, Mr. Bell, you've been around a few years, 35 years at that time, and um, I'm getting this comment that people are saying, quality's not as good as it used to be in the factory. Can you give me any advice, or we call it historical perspective? And, uh, and Mr. Bell, he's such a phenomenal fellow, uh, he, he sort of laughs, he sits back and goes, oh, 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 let me tell you. And I, I thought, oh, this is funny. But, uh, and he sort of said it in a nice way, and he goes, let me tell you a story, Peter. When I started the business in 1963, it wasn't within the first week or two, I had people in the factory coming, quality's not as good as Mr. Forrester owned it in the 50s. And uh, his point was not to not worry about the quality. It was, you know what, let's work hard. Memories are always better and things, 
repeat, have a habit of repeating themselves, learn from what's gone on in the past, but um, you know what, realize that, uh, that, that you do need to try to focus on moving forward, not living in the past. So, Purdy's vision. Tell you a, bit, a little bit where we're at today. Um, circa 1963, I said to Mr. Ruel uh, not so long ago, I said, did you have a vision of you know, where you were going to go, uh, what you were going to do, and what Purdy's was going to be in 1963? And he, uh, he said to me, uh, no, uh, you know what, vision, ha, huh, he says, the word didn't even exist. We didn't even sort of think about things in terms of vision, or certainly I didn't. He said, and then he thought for a second, he says, you know what, Peter, I did have a vision at one point. He says, you know, in the 1970s, when we were growing 20% a year, we were opening up the new malls, we had this tiny little factory. I did have a vision at that point. We were going to have a big problem if I didn't get a bigger factory. So that was his only vision at that time. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it, it moves forward today. He says he doesn't have a vision, but really this is what Mr. Ravel wrote in, uh, in the early, in the mid-60s. So this is the type of, Purdy's will be a place where people like to gather as in a community to work effectively at jobs they like and are challenged by amongst people they like to be with. We will work to make Purdy's a secure place, one where, if continually successful in the marketplace, then there will always be security of employment and an appropriate living standard provided. Very forward thinking for uh, the 1960s. And that's the type of culture that exists today that we really is, is so key to the foundation of what Purdy's is today. And that's something that we try to continue to foster with our teams today. So Purdy's vision today, I'll just tell you a little bit about where we're at today. Be the leading chocolatier in Canada. You know, we are a chocolatier. Uh, we have been for many years. We need to shout that loud and proud. We make chocolates, we sell chocolates. We are a chocolatier, and that's what we need to focus on. Really, to do that, we focus on three things. And I'll just give you the perspective on how we look at this. Um, I'm big on putting things into three. Because uh, I think that really resonates with people. It's easy um, to, for, for our teams to remember. Uh, we really look at customer touch points, number one. So that's chocolatier. Are we representing chocolatier in the look and feel of our shops, in our packaging, in our website? Um, all the touch points that our customers uh, look at. Are we representing chocolatier? The second, of course, is chocolate taste. So are we, um, we're a traditional company. We've been around for 105 years, but we're not an old company. We need to relish that tradition and those favorites that people have, but we need to be innovative and creative as well, like the Toronto you just had today. It's uh, that Gary, our head chocolatier, uh, developed in the, uh, in the last year. And the third point is chocolate knowledge. So this is really uh, around, are we ensuring that our teams have two things, passion for chocolate and expertise and knowledge in chocolate. So, and when they have those two things, then the experience that you appreciate in a pretty store is gonna be phenomenal. You're hopefully going to learn something more about chocolate. You're gonna be served by people that are passionate, that are foodies, that are thrilled by what they're, uh, sharing with you as a customer. And all these things are designed, how do we make a stronger connection with our customers? That's, that's what we do. We need to make that connection. How do we make a stronger connection? That's how Purdy's is gonna stay competitive into the future. And that's sort of where we're at today. So Purdy's mission, and I'll just quickly get into this. We've all spent lots of time going mission and vision and what's our mission and vision. I, there's three things again, right? Um, I, um, somebody told me uh, many years ago about a mission. Um, a mission can be easily defined as what your customer thinks of, thinks what you do. What, what your, what's your customer think about what you do? Full stop. That's assuming you, you, uh, you want, you agree with that and that's what you want to be. But if you stop a person on the street um, and, and, and ask them about Purdy's, um, they'll say something, they might say phenomenal. Uh, they'll say somewhere, they'll say something about those chocolates were incredible, the experience was amazing, and boy, those people were nice and friendly. So that's really fundamentally what we do. Fantastic, fun, phenomenal. Fantastic chocolates, fantastic experience, and fantastic people. And that's what we talk to about our teams, 
about are we doing this? You know, what we're doing day in and day out, are we living this mission? Are we, and that will help us get to this vision of the Lady Chocolatier in Canada. So, moving forward, we were known for packed chocolates. Quite say ye old chocolate shop, but we, we strive to be known as Chocolatier. And those are some of the things that we're implementing around Chocolatier, around that. So this is Gary, our head Chocolatier. He's everywhere right now. And you might have seen him on some of our TV ads and on our, he's on the side of our factory now. We, we, uh, we really show, he's an incredible person, incredibly creative, and he comes up with some amazing new chocolates. But and then I really just put this slide in to go back to what Mr. Favell talked about in the 1960s. Fantastic people, and Gary's a wonderful example of that in our organization. Um, what we do to support those, our teams are, you know, we, we ensure we train, we give them chocolate knowledge, we ensure that they have a passion for chocolate, and we support them with training. Um, in fact, all of our, uh, in the past year, all of our teams in the shops are now, um, as a, within three months of their start date of employment, they're trained to be chocolate connoisseurs, and we give them a name tag that says, you're a chocolate connoisseur. That represents something different. When they put that name tag on uh, that says you're a chocolate connoisseur, you've got to represent that with knowledge and passion, and that's what, we, that's what we're trying to do going forward. Um, so other things to stay competitive in changing times. And I've, just got, I've just got three slides, and I'll give you a little bit of a... Uh, information what we're doing in terms of sustainability to help long-term development in Africa. We get the majority of our cocoa from uh, West Africa. Had, a, had an amazing opportunity to go and visit uh, Ghana last October. Um, some amazing individuals on the ground there. We're, we're very proud supporters of the World Cocoa Foundation as well as we're, uh, we invent, we um, put a lot of money towards a, a foundation called the Windrock Foundation. Uh, the lady on the left there is uh, the lady that leads this foundation in, in Africa. And, it, and there's two things that we do uh, with our work in Africa. One is um, microloans and grants to single mothers. So this, this lady, and, her, and I took this picture of this lady, and um, they have received about a $150 grant, $150 US dollar equivalent uh, grant um, through uh, the foundation work that we're doing. And what they were doing with this, and we, we sat around, we had 30 single mothers telling us their stories. Um, to say it was ins inspirational is, is, doesn't do it justice. It was an incredible experience. Um, and, and these ladies sitting around told us, you know what, I've started this business now because of this grant. I can now close my, uh, give my, my young daughter clothes for school now so she can go to school. Um, they have uh, applied education and, and helped them foster their own business and create a better living standard for their family. So um, one lady's quote to us was, because of the grant, I'm okay and I'm free in life. I'm free and I'm okay in life, was her quote. Um, very, very uh, amazing. So that's some of the work we're doing. The second part we're doing in Africa um, and we're in the process of communicating this all through our website, to our customers, and our shops, to our customers. Um, it's just our way of, of continuing to, uh, one of the ways we're continuing to stay competitive and relevant. So the other thing we do is we work with farmers. And so we give education to farmers in the ground in Ghana. So again, saw, met many, many farmers. And just through basic agriculture practices, shade management, proper plantings, uh, crop spacings, um, they conservatively doubled their yields. And so this is a completely cash crop in, in Ghana. And so that means they doubled their income. And so the living standard and the, what they're able to uh, provide for their families completely changes the world. So this is, you know, we're doing, we're doing a small part of this. This is not to say this is going to change, uh, change the world in Africa, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's where we, there's, they're key partners for us, and so it's really important for us to give back and make a difference there. So, last couple of slides I have, before I show my video. Um, I have a short video. It's not a 3D, I hope it works. <laughs> um, this is a phenomenal evening. I mean, it's a phenomenal two days, this Food Pro Last. Uh, we have incredible strengths. 
collectively as in, in the food industry in British Columbia. We need to shout those out. And I know everybody will agree with him. Um, uh, you know, we need to shout those out. We have innovative and entrepreneurial. So some phenomenal examples here tonight, just a snapshot of some of them. Um, you know, we're multicultural. Gives us great opportunities to, for expansion and line extensions. We have incredible access to our ports. Um, you know, we, we have, we can learn from, we have startups to establish, we can learn from each other. That's, it's a phenomenal uh, industry and uh, so proud to be part of it. I kind of put a little plug in for the Food Processors Association. Purdy's has gained so much from the Food Processors Association. Um, and, and I'm preaching to the choir here in a minute. But uh, you know what? Let's encourage our, our colleagues that aren't here, that aren't part of this, because it's, there's so much value that we can all learn and collectively get better. The peer learning groups are phenomenal. I mean, our teams have gone to those, the food safety, the operational, uh, the lobbying efforts with the government when needed, delivery of key programs, mentoring programs. If anybody's not on board with helping out with the mentoring programs, I encourage you to get involved in that. And the education programs. Today and, uh, and tomorrow there'll be more. So um, yeah, I think the Food Processing Association, my hat goes off to everybody that's volunteered to uh, so many hours to, to make this successful. And it's, it's very exciting. So um, well done. Round of applause for that. So lastly, do you love what you make? And we need to love what we make. We happen to make amazing chocolates. It's a fantastic, is that word again? Fantastic um, industry to be in. Be in to make chocolates, it doesn't get any better. My wife says I can never leave, because chocolates is it. But I've got one video I want to show you. It celebrates, it was this video, and Adam's gonna load it up. Uh, he's great at loading, getting the videos all loaded up. This was put together um, in a partnership with BC Hydro. So a plug for BC Hydro there. Um, and um, and it, it gives you an idea of what Purdy's does in, in some of our initiatives, gives you a little insight into our uh, factory kitchen, um, talks about the, uh, the food processing industry in general. So enjoy. It's about two minutes.
just have to get the microphone back. Now, I'm not giving you chocolates today. Um, my wife chose this wonderful plant for you, Peter, because it's got all the different landscapes of the world in the bottom, and it's got a very good flower at the top.